Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Express Check-In. Today I'm recapping our last live show, episode 36, Wedding Bells. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. This week, we're answering a question from Zach Armstrong, who went over to tabletopbellhop.com and clicked on Ask the Bellhop. He wrote, we're getting married soon, and for the reception, while the wedding party gets photos taken, we want to put out some board games for the guests to play to pass the hour or so. What kind of games and setup would work well to make this a success? Well, the weekend before we recorded this episode, my wife, Deanna, and I attended the wedding of Tori and Kat, names you should recognize from our Gloomhaven live streams. That's what led us to answering this particular question next. Now, I honestly think this is a great idea. Now, Sean, my podcast co-host, agreed. He also noted that there's often a lot of downtime on your special day, and while the bride and groom may be kept busy with photographers and whatnot, other guests not in the wedding party may appreciate something to do. Now the thing is figuring out how to make it work. Now this means not only picking the right games, but making it so people actually want to play the games that are there. Now first off, I want to talk about that second part, way to make the games inviting and accessible. After that, I'll get to some actual game suggestions. Now, Sean had one point that I think is worth mentioning right out front. If you are the ones getting married, find someone else to take care of this. Your wedding tends to be overly stressful, even if you work hard to try to avoid anything big and fancy. Getting a friend to manage other non-essential aspects can be vital to your health, both physical and mental. So on to getting people to actually play the games on your big day. One key is removing as much of the intimidation factor as possible. Now, most people are not excited or interested in learning something new, and they are much more comfortable playing something they already know, especially in a social situation like a wedding where you're surrounded with a mix of family and strangers. That's why I think some of the best games for this kind of event are the games we all grew up playing and already know how to play. Now, if you want a bit more than just mass market games, make sure you're sticking to games that are very simple to learn. You want to pick games that can have their rules summarized on one page or less. And then consider actually putting these rules on an index card or a two-sided card. Games with rules people can pick up and read in moments and know how to play. Now, if at all possible, have someone at the event that's good at teaching games. Even better, have more than one. Get some volunteers to help you out here. If you have to take five minutes to teach Uncle John how to play the mind before the week before the wedding, do it. Have someone teach the games fits really well with the social aspect of the event, because you want people talking and laughing and having fun, not just sitting down and reading rules. Do what you can to make the games actually look inviting. Have them set up, have cards out on the table, have that Jenga tower already built. Have your rule summaries on index cards or cards sitting out in plain view with the game there, inviting people to play it. If the game requires you to, have, to keep score, make sure you have a pencil and score sheet sitting there ready. If there's cards, have the decks already shuffled. If there's tiles to lay out, lay them out ahead of time. Have everything ready to play and looking inviting trying to call people in to touch and play with them. Also, be sure to set expectations early. Let people know there's going to be games at your wedding. Put it right in the invitation. Don't surprise people. People are going to be more willing to take a chance and play along if they know what to expect ahead of time. Start selling it early and assure people they don't need to know the games and that it's all part of the fun of the wedding. Now, this is very important. Do not force anyone to play. Not everyone likes playing games. And even those people who do dig games then play them on a regular basis may not be comfortable playing games at an event like a wedding. There is a lot of social pressure at such a gathering and forcing people to play games, especially with strangers, can just make that worse. Now on to picking some specific games for your event, some recommendations. You want quick, fun games that people already know or are very easy to learn. You want people laughing and having a good time. Now is not the time to try to show off to the rest of your friends how good Puerto Rico is. Now is the time you want to hear someone yell out Yahtzee from across the room. 
Now, this is probably the one and only time on our podcast that you're going to hear me recommend mass market games. But games like Uno, Connect Four, Boggle, Blockus, and Quirkle are all great for this kind of event because most people already know how to play them. And if they don't, they're very quick to teach and learn. Now, a wedding is nothing but a big party, so party games work great here. Here's where I suggest games like Apples to Apples, Wits and Wagers, or Telestrations, a personal favorite of mine. Now, don't be completely afraid of breaking out some lighter, easier to learn hobby games too. Love Letter fits in perfect for a wedding, and they even make a special wedding edition that make great guest favors that people can take home at the end of the event. Now, I also suggest the card game The Mind, and this is one of the very few events where I'm actually going to think and suggest Flux, because I think it fits in great. The crazy nature of the game just gets people talking and laughing. Now, Bellhop fans know I love dexterity games, and a wedding is a great place to bring these out. All of these games really catch people's attention, and they're hard. Like, you have to resist just playing and fiddling with them. Games like Jenga and my personal favorite dexterity game, Hamster Roll, are great to have out on a table. Now, many weddings are attended by kids as well as adults, so having some kids' games on hand is worth doing. But even without kids, I've found these particular games go over great with adults. Now here I'm thinking of Looping Louie, Rhino Hero, and Animal Upon Animal. So those are some thoughts on what you can do to successfully integrate some tabletop gaming with your wedding. Now have you ever attended a wedding and had gaming as part of the event? Let us know in the comments below. If you're curious to hear more about these games, and to hear Sean and I discuss the topic of gaming at weddings in more detail, be sure to check out the full episode of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. That's episode 36. You can find it either on YouTube or on your favorite podcatcher. Receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email recapping all the content we've released the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and videos like the one you're watching right now. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you can find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Over 10 years ago, I received a sci-fi-based card game for my birthday. Shortly after getting the game and playing it a few times, I wrote up a review for it. That game is Race for the Galaxy. For last week's Throwback Thursday, I resurrected that classic review, reposting it on the Tabletop Bellhop blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Now, in addition, I added my current thoughts on the game. Now, anyone who's been a Bellhop fan, even for a small amount of time, knows that I still think highly of this game. So I'm not going to get into that old review here, but I think it's worth reading, just to see what I thought back when the game came out. So head over to the blog and check that out. A Gloomhaven update. Our band of adventurers is back on the trail of Jexira. Looking to Hale for aid, we were sent on some herb hunting quests so that Hale could cast some kind of location spell. Now, after doing some shopping and checking out the enhancement rules for the first time, which do seem really cool, but require way more gold than our party had earned, we headed off to the Vibrant Grotto. Uh, that's scenario number seven. Now, I particularly liked this scenario. It's one of my favorites by far. The map was just much larger than previous scenarios, and it's one where you didn't have to kill all the bad guys. I always enjoy when there's more to a scenario than just kill all the things. Now, in this particular scenario, our goal was to loot a bunch of chests. See, the interesting thing with this is you had to actually use a loot action, which meant actually using your loot cards, which for our group at least, and especially my character, meant adding them back into our decks because most of us don't bring our loot cards with us on a normal event. So it was cool to get some of those cards back into our decks. Now, the scenario seemed to go rather well, despite splitting up the group. The whole adage of don't split the party didn't seem to apply here. Now, a big part of that was two of our party members' ability to summon allies. The two of them split off, and with their summons, were pretty much a full party on their own. Now, you can check out our adventure yourself right here on YouTube. Just look for our Gloomhaven playlist. You can also watch us play live every Friday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back at the games that hit our tabletops in the last week. 
This week I'm talking about a couple of prototypes. Up first, it's the Fields and Flocks expansion for Builders of Blankenberg, an expansion that's coming to Kickstarter in, in April. At this point, I played with Fields of Flocks a few times, and through working with the designer, seemed to have all the rules figured out. Cobblestone Games has been great to work with on this. Fields and Flocks adds a worker placement aspect to Builders of Blankenberg and significantly increases the weight and the playtime of the game. Having played it with a few different groups of players, I'm pleased to report that for one, introducing new rules even with players who have not played just with the base game seems to work fine, just throw them right in. Overall, I think this is a solid addition to the game, to a game I consider a hidden gem. Now the other prototype I got played was Cypress Legacy. Now this was more of a mixed bag. This is a very old school style game that used a lot of dated mechanics. Things like roll and move and miss a turn. It's not the kind of game I expected to enjoy, yet I've had fun every time I played it. The theme has a lot to do with this. Now I'm not going to get into details here, you can listen to the full podcast for that, but I will just say this game seems to have the sushi effect for me. It's a bunch of individual parts that are things I generally don't like, but when you put them all together, it works, somehow. Now the only game my co-host Sean got in was the Birds of Prey set for the DC deck building game. He had a lot of good things to say about this expansion. It adds a new mechanic of being able to turn your in-play cards and getting a reward for getting to the turn a full 360 degrees. Sounded pretty cool to me. Sean did worry that mixing this set with other sets may dilute this new ability, but using the set on its own, it works really well. He also knew that it's supposed to team well with the Teen Titans standalone expansion, something Sean has added to his wish list. Now, I feel the need to point out that Cryptozoic seems to be doing a great job of getting Sean to buy all the various bits and bobs for this game. As usual, this weekly look back only scratches the surface. For more discussion about these games, be sure to check out the full podcast when it goes live Tuesday mornings at 2 a.m., both on YouTube and on your favorite podcatcher. We're here to answer your questions. Do you have a gaming or game night question you'd like us to tackle on a future Ask the Bellhop segment? You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or you can head over to the website tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Remember that we record a new episode of Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and we would love it if you would join us in the lobby, our live chat room. If you've been enjoying the content we're providing, it would be fantastic if you would consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Express Check-In. You can always find us all across the web in social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, or drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Be sure to subscribe to our channel by clicking over here and check out our latest video by clicking over there. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge. Good night and game on.